my fourth uh, Near Map Navigate. Uh, and each year I've had the privilege of unveiling an exciting new chapter in our story of Near Map AI. In 2019, we uh, launched our beta capability, processing over a million square kilometers of imagery and producing petabytes of AI outputs. In 2020, we saw our first generally available AI product, Near Map AI, where you could visualize in Map Browser and export property attributes in your local area. 2021 was a game changer. We switched to doing wall-to-wall -wall HD vector maps with AI on every survey as we fly. We were making it available very fast. Uh, other people were doing uh, little property assessments and returning a response in five or 10 seconds. We could clip out a chunk of our HD vector map the size of a property and return it in a couple of hundred milliseconds. And I've seen these APIs push to 50 or 100 million properties in just 24 hours. So what's the next step in this incredible journey? As has been mentioned, we've just launched our Gen 5 AI system. But it's not just about a better HD vector map. Uh, it's, it's a whole platform for a suite of new products. Before I get into the details of those, I want to talk to you a little bit about Gen 5 itself. Firstly, uh, that powerful single deep learning model that sits under the hood with Gen 4 has been upgraded. It's got 55 million parameters that capture its understanding of the visual world, and they've been upgraded with a, a training data set that's 2.6 times the size of what we had in Gen 4. To put that in context, think images like this uh, that human experts have labeled carefully with, with buildings and swimming pools and all sorts of other things. Uh, we have over a million of these human annotated images in our data set now, and it's still growing. This is well beyond the scale of what you see in most deep learning projects. In terms of layers, it's been described before, we had 49 layers in Gen 4, but we didn't make them all available via vector. In Gen 5, we've reached 78. Uh, and they're all available via APIs uh, and as vector data. This is the more detailed version of, of Don's slide. We'll do a comparison. This is Gen 4. You can see the AI layers enumerated below. That's what's been available for uh, a little while now. In light blue, I'm highlighting the layers that have received a significant performance bump. Uh, for the geeks out there, that's at least a 2% bump in F1 score. And that's what happens when you throw in Gen 5. All of the pink layers are available for the first time behind our APIs as vector data, and there's just so much there, I can't talk about it all. Uh, just to highlight a couple of areas, uh, roof condition got a huge work over for Gen 5. Uh, a lot of the labeling work went into specifically roof condition, major improvements on our existing five layers, and three additional more subtle and nuanced layers. Surface permeability, uh, we saw a lot of you out there using our surfaces pack to do stormwater modeling and, and flood modeling and, and looking where water runs off. Uh, what we found here was that you can actually uh, solve the problem more directly. Rather than trying to tell the difference between uh, asphalt and concrete, uh, for example, we taught the model to directly estimate whether water was likely to so soak into the surface or not. Uh, so there's just two layers, they're simpler, they're cleaner, and they perform better for this task. So if that's your use case, get into it. Uh, and then there's the rest. I'm not going to go through them all, I don't have time. Uh, we do have a little video to play uh, that'll give you a taste. Give me some more. Give me some more. What you got? Give me some more of that. La 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 la. 
That's the core of what's in our new Gen 5 AI vector maps. But what's this about a product platform? Uh, the first bit I want to talk to you about is the Rollup API. Uh, this is already released in production, and anyone who has access to the AI feature API can access the Rollup API. Instead of giving you a miniature map of your area, as you see on the left with the AI feature API, what you're getting here is uh, a simplified set of facts per address. You get a single row CSV file for your request with over 500 columns. That's what we call facts per address. It uses the same credit system and data under the hood as the AI feature API, but it solves the geospatial problem for you. The Rollup API means that you as a software developer can get straight into integrating it with your uh, enterprise architecture and applications without that same level of geospatial expert knowledge. If you want to know facts like uh, how many buildings are there on the property, what the area of the largest building is, uh, the total area of tree canopy, whether that piece of water overlapping the back uh, area of your property is a small pond or a massive harbour, all of those are added in as columns in the data. So some facts can be calculated easily on the fly, like those. Uh, some can't. Some are heavier calculations. Uh, with Gen 5, we're actually now pre-computing buffered calculations for every single building across 13 of our AI layers that are hand-picked to resemble uh, useful attributes for uh, risk assessment, particularly relating to fire. So for every 5 foot, 10 foot, 30 foot, 100 foot and 300 foot buffer, we're telling you how much of each of these attributes are present. Uh, and uh, our buffers ignore property boundaries and go beyond them uh, in the same way that a, a real catastrophe does. It doesn't matter who owns it, it's what's there physically that matters. So there's now three types of fact that we're building on Gen 5. One is those fast on the fly calculations with the Rollup API. Two is uh, those heavier geospatial calculations with the buffers. And the third are machine learning models that sit on top of our Gen 5 output. Uh, we're deploying these models to do things like uh, produce a risk probability or uh, summarize complex information into an answer you can use directly. At uh, the leading edge of this is the roof condition summary score. We take our eight subtle roof condition layers with signals like this in the raster, uh, and we can turn that into polygons and roof attributes. And then a model on top of that digests those eight layers into a single uh, roof condition summary score for every building, a 0 to 100 point numeric scale and a five point uh, very poor to very good scale. We're now going to move into some practical examples and we're going to focus these uh, in the post-catastrophe environment. Uh, some of this imagery is tough to look at. Uh, and it's a little bit harrowing, but it's important to show uh, what we can do to help in these scenarios. We'll start with uh, the mill fire in the US. This was uh, a little over a month ago. Uh, we captured it within a day or two uh, of the fire occurring, uh, starting at a town called Weed in California. Uh, according to local newspaper reports, uh, this is the area uh, that the fire started in, in the south. Uh, it then swept north uh, through a town Further north, uh, through a forest, you can see the, the black and grey scarring in the landscape, and it spreads and widens as the fire continues, uh, driven by strong winds, uh, until it eventually ends. If we move back to that first warehouse that we saw, we can actually take a look at it prior to the event. In fact, we captured this location less than a month prior to the event, on the 6th of August this year. Now, it doesn't take a very keen eye to start spotting the risks on this roof, uh, but we're going to look at it through the lens of Gen 5. First in pink, we've got our junk and wreckage. You can see there's debris all over the yard, but also even all over the top of the roof itself. We're going to look at structural damage in red. Uh, there's extensive structural damage, and even if you go back several surveys, you see that structural damage has been present for a long time. We'll see some rusting along the top edge in yellow. Uh, maybe less of a big deal for this kind of risk scenario, but it adds to the picture. And then in the top right, that sort of last barely serviceable corner of the roof, uh, you have extensive ponding damage. That's water damage uh, on, on flat roofs. And all things combined, if you run that uh, roof condition summary score model on top of it, you get a total score of 17 out of 100, or very poor. 
If we move beyond the building itself, we can see that what looked initially like brown earth uh, was actually, there's quite a lot of brown dry grass around there uh, that's shown in a different shade of pink. Then in white, you can see there's shrubs and bushes that allow the fire to ladder up uh, through the grass into the shrubs and bushes and into these uh, green trees uh, above. If we zoom out a little bit, uh, and turn all those vegetation layers green, you can see that vegetation that bridges uh, that warehouse area to the township north. But what is it that really took this fire out of control as it sped further north into the forest? Uh, locals know that it has been uh, very hot and dry conditions, but is there something that we can see in the imagery other than that it looks a bit brown? If we get more quantitative, uh, now, this will be hard to spot uh, in this. We're going to zoom in shortly so you can see it in greater detail. In red, we have vegetation debris. In pink, we have leaf off trees. Now, this is August. Uh, there's not meant to be leaf off trees in summer unless they're dead or in very poor health. In yellow, we have our junk and wreckage. And you can see that sprinkled throughout this whole forest, there's a lot of each of these. If we zoom in on a patch, you can start to visually see that fallen timber and the health of some of those standing trees but it stands out in stark relief with the automated Gen 5 AI layers. Red is showing you those fallen timbers, and pink is showing you the ones that are still standing but don't have leaves on them. Uh, this area is just uh, yeah, set, set to go. Um, if you look after the burn, um, you can compare that top central area. There was less vegetation debris, and you can see that's the area that's actually survived a little better in this patch of forest. Um, so as we do this, uh, we're actually starting to move beyond just the presence of vegetation, but starting to think about the health of the vegetation in the area. This is a different building, uh, but it was in the path of the same fire. And we're going to go and look at those buffers that I talked about before. Uh, within five feet, you start to see junk and wreckage uh, connected to that building. Within 10 feet, you see more junk and wreckage. 30 feet, you're seeing uh, an outbuilding, uh, which presents fire risk, uh, as well as uh, some trees and shrubs starting to come in. At 100 feet, we're seeing other things. Uh, we're seeing more trees and shrubs, a couple more outbuildings, and we're seeing these power lines uh, in electric blue uh, that pre present a risk all of their own uh, in wind and fire events. And then if we go all the way out to 300 feet, uh, that's about 100 metres, uh, you can see a chunk of the forest and also some aspects of its health with those uh, pink and, and red dots of leaf-off vegetation and vegetation debris. With 13 different AI layers and five buffer distance, that adds 65 new semantic risk factors for you to put uh, in your risk models. As a point of comparison, this is what's possible with 30 metre Landsat pixels. Uh, there's a fantastic national data set of land cover like this. It covers everywhere. But if you're trying to look at individual property risk, it just can't reach the same level of nuance that's required. In fact, if we go back to that area where the fire started and we look deeply at that vegetation that allowed uh, the, the fire to bridge across, you can see that according to the Landsat pixels, you actually get no vegetation at all. Uh, the official wildland urban interface um, uh, census blocks in the area that use Landsat save 0% vegetation cover. So Gen 5 of NIMAP AI, uh, I think, ushers in a new era of risk management. Uh, it's the foundation for a wide range of exciting new products that sit on top of it with unrivaled accuracy and semantic richness under the hood. We're moving now from fire to wind, uh, and we're going to look at Hurricane Ida here. Uh, a little video from one of our uh, internal tools doing a screen record when we were checking out how well our AI can uh, pick up damage uh, after a wind event. And you'll see us start to bring the AI la layers in. In purple there, that's cloud detection for you. Uh, we're using the same sorts of colours uh, as the previous imagery to help you kind of mentally get your head around it. Um, we've got roof damage, uh, there's uh, tarpaulins going on as temporary repairs, even a crane, a construction vehicle in the top right, starting to clean up some of the junk and wreckage. Swimming pools, unmaintained swimming pool is one of our new layers, and uh, the water has gone all dark and murky after the storm. And what you start to see with this video is we're really good at avoiding clouds normally, uh, but with post-catastrophe scenarios, you get more challenging visual environments. Uh, a lot of the work in Gen 5 was actually making it so that we can see, uh, maybe not through the thickest cloud that we detect as thick cloud, but through thin cloud, we're actually getting pretty good ability to detect uh, damage and debris. 
Uh, that's a clearer area where there's just some, some down trees and things, but this is an area where there's a decent amount of thin cloud, but we're still detecting even through that cloud. And then as we zoom out um, to look at the community as a whole, uh, we're going to wind back those AI layers just to look at the imagery, and you start to appreciate the difference that they make as you try and quickly explore what's going on. I'm now going to talk you through an incredibly powerful feedback loop that has arisen between our impact response program, our postcat AI, uh, and our risk modeling. And I'm going to use Hurricane Ian that uh, uh, was talked about earlier uh, as it's such a fresh and, and recent example. So we captured all this imagery for Hurricane Ian, and we then ran it through our postcat AI system, uh, running 14,000 square kilometers of imagery in just a few days. Uh, you can see the summary statistics, 136,000 pieces of structurally damaged roof in that area, 30,000 pieces of which already had some temporary repairs in place. If you take all the bits of junk and debris in yellow and add them up, you get 3.7 square miles of it. Uh, if you do the same thing with the vegetation debris, you get 5.7 square miles of it. The devastation is widespread, uh, and we can pick it up with this granular data, uh, but we can do it at the scale of the whole catastrophe. What becomes possible off the back of that automated data is that we can use those to drive where we want our human experts to get 100% certainty on which buildings survived, which ones were damaged, and which ones were destroyed. Uh, we've actually embarked on an immense labelling project on over all of our historical post-catastrophe surveys, uh, hundreds of them, uh, and trying to identify every damaged building that we can possibly find. In the future, we'll be doing this on a continual basis as new surveys come in from impact response, uh, allowing us to keep our data set up to date uh, as the very nature of these events uh, and climate changes. As time goes on, I believe that this will become a more powerful catastrophe loss data set than anything else out there. There'll be countless major disasters captured, labelled and managed consistently. Consistently managed regardless of which insurer insures a particular house uh, in an area, uh, consistent regardless of different state protocols for recording data, uh, and consistent even across national boundaries with our combined Australian and US impact response program. Once we have those verified human expert labels on which buildings are damaged, we can then go back to our 500 facts per address prior to the event. And we can build machine learning models to identify the likelihood of damage occurring in the event of a catastrophe. And of course, the next step is to deploy those models at large scale, which we can do, um, making these risk scores available per building uh, updated every time we fly. That's not going even into 3D and Hyper Camera 3. Uh, there's just so much more that can be done with this data. Uh, in this image, you'll see a fire uh, magically stop on that blue line uh, until you look at it in 3D and you realize that's just a ridge top. And 3D shape of the land impacts uh, quite substantially how fires move through the landscape and even which parts of vegetation uh, are drier or, or wetter. Uh, if you want to hear more about that, I suggest you go and listen to John Corbett's talk, uh, where he's going to leverage his extensive flood risk modelling expertise to talk about uh, how floods move through a landscape. I'm going to finish with just a little teaser for a second talk I'm doing at Navigate. Uh, some of you will have seen this image. It shows the percent of the population in each of Australia's capital cities that is uh, living in a leafy suburb. Uh, you would have seen that uh, on our blogs in the media uh, if you followed us. I just finished crunching the numbers on the US as a whole. It's a slightly larger data set. We're talking more than 110 million building footprints, uh, more than 83% of the US population. And if you look at the tree layer, you can calculate something like what percent of the US population are living in a leafy census block. And if you'd like to know that number, you can join me for my session later. <laughs> Thank you.